everyone, it's Judy Warner. Welcome back to the On Track Podcast. Today we talk with Happy Holden, who's otherwise known as the father of HDI. He's the author of the HDI Handbook. Also, there's the HDI Guidebook that's now on All Tim's website. He's fascinating to listen to. We'll talk about how he went from being a small town boy to being on a first name basis with his bosses, which were none other than Hewlett and Packard. I think you'll enjoy the stories he has to share, and he'll also talk about the talk he's gonna give at All Team Live as one of our keynotes on Smart Factory, how we're gonna get to the point where we have digitized data and about AI. He also has a full day talk in which he discusses HDI and the considerations you need to keep in mind when you're doing HDI. I think you'll enjoy this one. I'll see you on the other side. Welcome to All Team's On Track Podcast, where we talk to leaders about PCB design, tackling subjects ranging from schematic capture all the way to the manufacturing floor. I'm your host, Judy Warner. Please listen in every week and subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcast apps. And be sure to check out the show notes at altium.com forward slash podcast, where you can find great resources and multiple ways to connect with us on social media. Well, Happy, thank you so much for joining us on the On Track podcast today. We're delighted to have you. Sure. Always a pleasure to speak with you, although this is my first podcast with you. Have you been on any podcast before? Oh, I think long ago. Usually the webinars. Yeah. Those, but um, they're like kind of like podcasts. Yeah, they are. They are a little bit. Well, um, before we get started, I thought I'd uh, cue you up and just ask you to share a little bit about your very illustrious and interesting professional background in the electronics industry. Yeah, the, uh, unfortunately, I have your questions ahead of time, so I get a chance to think about, I don't think, the, the, the first thing I, I have to comment is, l- looking back at the last, well, 60 years, uh, it has been, uh, I, I've probably been very fortunate, lucky as you might say, um, being at the right place at the right time, not because, you know, I was smarter than anybody else, I just happened to be lucky and being at the right place. You know, throughout your career, you, you make these choices, you never know how they're going to pan out. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, um, like I said, the professional career, um, a lot of it was because my father retired from the Navy and we moved from Southern California, San Diego, where I would have gone to a high school of uh, 1,700 students. And instead we went to the end of the power lines in the mountains of Oregon at the uh, in a logging community where the high school had 90 students in it. Wow. 20, 21 in my class. <laughs> um, uh, and you would think that that would be a disadvantage, but years later, I read an article in the Oregonian paper where the Oregonian was trying to figure out why the highest performance students at a high school had the lowest budget. And they were talking about my high school in Alsea, Oregon, which is a, a logging community, which had the lowest budget of virtually any high school compared to the big Portland or Beaverton high schools and things like that. With all the money in the world, our little high school had the, the highest performance. Um, and um, they got, they were trying to delve into it. They got about seven out of 10 correct. They, they missed three important ones, which you'd have to kind of be there as a student. To, one of the most important that they missed was we were too small to have a cafeteria. And so mothers of the students would cook lunch and bring it in every day hmm. and serve it to the, the high school and grade school kids. Um, the, there was only one school, so grade school is on one side and high school is on the other side of the gymnasium, the center. But So what they didn't recognize was that parents were in our high school every single day, hmm. all, all the time. And the principal knew the students from when they were first graders up until they graduated from high school. Typically, yeah. yeah. The other, th- the other thing they missed was we were over the mountain from the university, hmm. and 
most of their money was paid for uh, the teachers. And so the teachers, when their husband or wife were getting a PhD at the university, the other one would look for the highest paying job to teach at, which was actually our little um, community um, school. And so my, a lot of my teachers, although they had credentials, were PhDs. Wow. Um, and so my math and science teacher was a PhD in physics. Um, he, he wasn't from an educational school. He was a pure researcher in, mm -hmm. in physics. But his wife was getting a PhD. Um, and so the second thing is he was an avid fisherman. So every day after school, as we left, we would see him out beyond the football field sitting in the water fly fishing for trout or salmon every single day uh, kind of thing. Um, the other thing that they partially missed was uh, we didn't have enough students um, for the full curriculum. And so as a freshman, I had to take physics with the seniors because physics was only offered every other year. And then alternative years, it was chemistry. Um, and so when you're a freshman, sitting in a class with seniors, there's a whole different dynamics. And there was only eight of us mm -hmm. in the class. Mm -hmm. So when you had labs and things like that with only eight students, you, you know, you got the attention of, of, of a PhD kind of full time. So um, the deny dynamics there were different. And yeah. So, so what people didn't realize was that uh, on the senior years, most people would kind of coast um, my parents, you know, were after a high achievement and they wouldn't let me coast. So they found out that I could enter the university without graduating from high school. So in my senior level in high school, I had a full load because three days a week I would drive over the mountain and take classes at the university. You were doing that concurrently, your senior yeah. of high school and university. And university. Wow. Um, which is which, which I never told any of the girls I dated at college that United you know, was still in high school. That would have been <laughs> mortifying. <laughs> we, we also had um, uh, professors that were Nobel Prize winners teaching undergraduate courses, Linus Pauling. And Linus Pauling's roommate, um, uh, uh, Augusta Chenovich, um, whose reaction engineering book has been translated into 70 languages all over the world. Wow. And having a course like reaction engineering um, it was uh, us undergraduates and PhD chemists chemists getting their PhDs what a funny so little say, what a funny little corner of the world to get such a rich experience yeah we we, we once challenged him in a, a student chapter in which he was blindfolded and had 25 chess games going simultaneously against 25 of us students as a team oh. he was blindfolded and, and won all 25 chess matches. Oh, good Lord. You so know, it's, obviously brilliant. Uh, so that's kind of the the front end of my, you know, I just lucked into being at the right place at the right time. I mean, so where'd you end up after college? Well, um, one of the interesting thing is, is that uh, I went to interviews for DuPont and Dow Chemical and Exxon, the classical chemical engineering. But I got a call out of the blue from somebody from a company called Hewlett Packard that um, wanted to interview me um, since um, uh, I didn't really know much about them. But they said that Professor Wicks had recommended me. Well, he's our the major professor. And if our top professor is recommending me, then, yeah, I'm going to listen to these guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tactic I later learned from HP, how HP does all of its college recruiting. Is, yeah, they have an open list that anybody can sign up, but they always make friends with major professors. And the, the big questions a day or two early is who's your top student? And, you know, who, you know, and if you're the top student hasn't signed up on our list, we'll call that person up and say, well, we'll make a time interview day or night or over dinner, or anything you want at, at your convenience. Um, so this guy came in from Hewlett Packard. Um, being in Oregon, everything we had was Tektronics. Mm -hmm. um, but but if you didn't get to lab early in electrical engineering, then you had to use kind of the surplus HP gear, which wasn't state-of-the-art like the tech. So that's the only impression I had of Hewlett Packard was 
these damn oscilloscopes that wouldn't trigger properly at age 150s. <laughs> so tell me more about, you know, where you ended up for with HP and, and how you ended up uh, moving that direction. Well, like I said, the uh, um, I got past that interview mm-hmm. uh, and invited down to Palo Alto to um, interview uh, with with the integrated circuit department there at um, HP, uh, and it was really fun because I found out HP was more advanced than IBM when it came to integrated circuits. What they were talking about was a technology they had in which they made um, high frequency and RF circuits out of the germanium and silicon, but it was placed upon sapphire wafers. Sapphire. So Sapphire. So it's called silicon on sapphire, SOS. Um, that allowed much less parasitics and much, much higher frequency than you could ever get out of pure silicon. Hmm. Um, uh, Intel hardly existed as a company. They were a, a little strong startup. The only uh, other IC firm was Fairchild in the Bay Area. But um, HP had this really, really advanced. So, you know, the fact that I'd be their first chemical engineer in IC production was brilliant. But the thing that brought me home was the fact we were in the cafeteria there in Palo Alto, and the uh, older engineer hosting me was saying, yeah, there, there are no offices in Hewlett Packard. Even the executives, Bill Hewlett, Dave Packard, they don't have offices. They have a corner um, just, you know, like you, like you'll have. In fact, you know, there's Bill Hewlett carrying his tray in line here in cafeteria, four people in front of us, just like anybody else. Contrast that with my interview at DuPont in Wilmington, Delaware, where I stayed at the DuPont Hotel, had meals at the DuPont Executive Dining Room, and they talked about what would be like my next 30 years that were all mapped out for me. Um, I'm 21 years old, where the DuPont guys have mapped out 30 years. Hewlett Packard, they don't have any chemical engineers. They're showing me problems that I think I can easily solve because the electrical and mechanical engineers don't have the training I do. And it, yes, it's a small company of less than 2,000 people, but it really sounds exciting for a youngster. Mm-hmm. And, and like I said, there was less than 2,000 employees when I started. And when I retired 28 years later, there was 167,000 employees. My goodness. And we went from less than 200 million in sales per year to 54 billion. And so, um, one of the slides I put posted at the end of my um, Altium Live a keynote is a, uh, my history at Hewlett Packard and the sales of Hewlett Packard um, from when I started and ended. And it has to be a, a logarithmic scale because you, you can't possibly put uh, it on a linear scale when you go from 200 million to uh, uh, that's wild. Five thousand four hundred mi- million kind of thing, you know. So is, um, but and all of that, um, all of that growth in product line and opportunity, Prince Circuits was in, involved in every single one of those products. At one time, twenty three thousand separate electronic products. Wow. So how did you find your way into the PCB side of things there? I mean, obviously there was a lot going on, but. One of the first things I did um, was I redesigned all of the, the PC boards I'd left the university um, because we had a, a, a Slosen uh, artwork generator. At that time we were hand taping everything and doing photo reduction, but in integrated circuits, we had a thing called a Slosen machine which predates Gerber, but we would photo plot our IC artwork, and I photo plotted, and then had uh, HP gold boards made, and assembled and soldered, tested, and then I shipped them back to the university. Say, hey, all of those PC boards I, I designed and built, throw them all away, and here are the substitute ones that won't give you, you know, the noise problems that, you know, that you're yeah. just stuck with. Yeah. Well, like like I said, uh, um. One of the things that I was lucky was that um, in 1968, HP 
actually developed a, a 64-bit computer of the size of a typewriter um, called the 9100. And because nobody believed that a computer, um, 64-bit computers had to be the size of a room. They couldn't be the size of a typewriter. So HP always sold it as a desktop calculator mm. rather than a computer. But it was a 64-bit machine. But one of the things was Bill Hewlett wanted that computer um, to, to be able to be put in this pocket and be battery powered. So by 1972, I was involved with Hewlett on uh, making this HP 35 calculator, which was battery powered and you put in your pocket. Mm -hmm. um, well, the, the, the interesting role print and circuits played is the only electrical keyboard at 1972 was IBM Selectric Typewriter. And it was this, you know, great big key. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, we, we needed a, a keyboard that was a quarter of an inch deep. And mm -hmm. so they had to come up with a, a reliable keyboard. Um, so I threw a couple of those pictures in on my end of my keynote because the unique solution was this gold-plated board with gold spot-plated barium copper annealed and welded to the PC board to make these little tiny uh, keys mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. were enormously reliable. Mm -hmm. um, and it was interesting because I came to work one day and Bill Hewlett was actually sitting at my desk at 7.30 in the morning waiting for me because uh, he had an idea that we should build a, the calculator all on one circuit. And he drew this flexible circuit display keyboard. And um, we, uh, w what he was drawing was a flex rigid. And we... We tried, but we had no idea in the world how to make a, a gold-plated, you know, flex-rigid PC board that would be reliable. So we ended up with an eight-layer logic board, a double-sided keyboard, and we soldered the displays in at an angle. Uh, but it was interesting that Bill Hewlett's idea is the way calculators are, are made today, but we just, you know, didn't have the time to figure out how to make a flex-rigid. That's interesting. It's, you know, I thought what was interesting when we were talking the other day is you told me that HP kind of had started out uh, previous to that being really um, focused also on agriculture. So tell us about their tomato pickers. Well, you got to remember HP started in 1938 by two graduate students at Stanford University, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard. They, they had just got their master's degrees. Um, so they were, their professor Terman, their professor, you know, encouraged them to start this company. Well, the, the, the only product they had was Bill Hewlett did his master's thesis on audio oscillator, a, a more reliable. And, and so Walt Disney bought six of them, but that, you know, that was their only company. So in the Bay Area here, uh, they're growing a lot of tomatoes and had to use a lot of uh, Mexican laborers to pick these things. Um, so so they tried making an automatic tomato picker, which didn't work. Um, <laughs> the, the whole agricultural scheme, um, you know, wasn't too successful, but Terman uh, focused on the needs we had for radar development, and radar development was still real important. So they started doing RF um, monitoring equipment. And then the war came along, and Bill Hewlett, went in the Signal Corps as a captain. Dave Packard stayed back here and ran the business. Well, Bill would constantly send back captured German electronics that he had, which <laughs> they would analyze. And, um, and, um, and so while the, the, the HP products were, they always kind of benchmarked against the German and, and all of the radar analysis and other things like that was always better than anybody else's because Hewlett and Packard were analyzing what was good and bad about these things, and the professors at Stanford would, would help out. So they formed a really uh, effective team of, uh, of innovating in electronics. Wow. So HP came out of the war, you know, enormous growth and profitability, um, and, and a, a lot of friends, you know, that formed other major um, companies. In fact, one of the, the things I noted was that my future father-in-law, who was an engineering professor at Oregon State, his roommate at MIT was Volum, who started Tektronix. Kind wow. Of thing. Um, and so, uh, the, uh, but 
Tektronics was larger than Hewlett Packard when I started. And when I retired, HP was 48 times larger than Tektronics. Wow. I mean, it's just... It must have been you know, such an exciting time. You really were just living Well, I call it golden in, age. Yeah, you know? it was a golden age. And here you are right in the middle of it on a first name basis with Hewlett and Packard. Like, what a rare, interesting time. Well, the interesting thing is that I was only four years out of college, and they gave me the job of automating the printed circuits. I, I started an integrated circuit, but after six months, somebody they came to me and said, um, you're our only chemical engineer, and the printed circuit people down the hill are having technical problems. Could you go down and see if you could help them out? So I was on Page Mill Hill, Page Mill Road, they were on Porter Drive, so I went down the hill, walked down the hill, into the printed circuit shop, which I just couldn't believe my eyes. There was hundreds of people running around humping racks where the, you know, acids are dripping on the redwood floor. And, you know, first they got electroplating, and then over there they've got uh, machine tools drilling holes in the boards, and over there they got hydraulic presses pushing, laminating them together, and they got test machines over here, and they got, you know, four, 30 women screen printing um, images, you know, on this copper and everything. Um, couldn't believe my eyes. Um, there was there was such a convoluted process compared to our IC process, which is all yep. clean room and, and highly organized. Um, and well, and I tell this to people when you you have to go through a board shop a bunch of times before you really get it because it doesn't. The manufacturing process does not move in a linear fashion like assembly does where parts come in the front end, they go through a line, a, you know, wave saw or whatever, you know, an oven and then out the back door. It doesn't work like that at all. It's like you print and etch and then you laminate and you bring it back to print. <laughs> you know, it, it goes back and forth and it really, it, it is, it looks convoluted. It is orderly, but it, what you're saying is so true. Well, one of the things I told him is, look, you guys are never going to get a handle on this process if you keep dipping it in water. Because, because this material and everything else does not like water. You know, in, in semiconductors, we're all vacuum and sputtering and things. We, you know, we don't let this anywhere near something that's yes. water-based yeah. kind of thing. Um, but, um, so I didn't know anything about printed circuits, but I did know how to solve problems. And that was one of the key things they taught me as a chemical engineer. Don't worry what's happening in that vat. Just treat it as a black box. Look at what's coming in and what's going out and the dynamics. Let the chemists worry about what's being made and things like that. Your job, make this chemical at a profit. And so I treated all of these problems in printed circuits as black boxes. And using design of experiments, which they had never heard of, um, I went through dozens and dozens of problems in, in a matter of two months. And consequently, they felt, well, I was a genius. No, I wasn't a genius. I just had a, a very good tool called design of experiments to treat the unknown. You know, I didn't have to, to know, you know, well, how did you know the variables? Well, I went and asked the operators and I asked the supervisors with a clipboard, what do you think is causing this problem? I called the vendor, what do you think is causing this problem? I went to a book called Print Circuit Handbook from Coombs, you know, you know, which was published in 67. What's in there? And it ended up with a checklist that made a Pareto of what could cause this. And then with partial factorial experimentation, I could quickly find out the causes and interactions and correct them. None of the electrical mechanical engineers had ever had that kind of training. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were doing the wrong thing. They were trying, holding everything constant and changing one thing at a time. And mm -hmm. the solution is never one thing. It's usually a combination of things, yeah. including the intangibles, day shift versus night shift, um, Monday versus Friday, um, you know, spring versus summer, water A, reagent A, vendor A, tank one versus tank seven. Those are, uh, qualitative variables, not quantitative. Mm -hmm. And the engineers went to the quantitative variables and ignored the qualitative variables. Mm -hmm. uh, but not a chemical engineer. Right. You know, we deal with both. Right. And that was the solution. Right. So that got me a stock award, um, first ever given by the board of directors to somebody in manufacturing. Oh, that's cool. And, and then by the time the calculator people came along and um, 
and we needed to expand the ex production explosion by tenfold, you know, they gave me the opportunity to automate the whole thing with a huge budget. Yeah, so tell us about that explosion of the calculator market. Well, that th th was fun because Bill Hewlett personally drove the project, but marketing was saying, well, nobody's going to pay $400 for this calculator. Um, you know, we're lucky if we sell 400 a month. Well, 400 a month was the run of a large voltmeter, so no particular things. But within two months of introducing the calculator, orders were coming in at 3000 an hour. Oh, my and, gosh. <laughs> and, and we're geared for 400 a month. Oh, my gosh. How did you address that? Well, everybody panicked. Um, yeah, of course. Um, and so I went on the road with everybody else to find everybody in the Western United States to make multilayers for us. Nobody wanted to touch with the keyboard because it was gold plated and, and welded, you know. So all of our internal capacity had to be making the keyboard, but we needed everybody in the Western United States to make the eight layer logic board for us. Um, so when I got back from that, um, we turned it over to purchasing everything. Um, HP was vertically integrated. And so I made a proposal, well, we can automate production and take over the entire building. And they, and they said, well, give us an estimate of budget and a proposal, but make it no longer than one page. <laughs> and so I did a, a one page business proposal, you know, five or $6 million to automate everything. And they said, fine, you know, get started. I said, well, I'm gonna need a few more engineers. <laughs> uh, a few more chemical engineers. Right. <laughs> you know, and so, uh, you know, I went back to University of Washington, Oregon State, and uh, University of Michigan Tech, and uh, Illinois Institute of Technology to recruit chemical engineers. Uh, and then so that, you know, I, I promoted from just being a process engineer to being a process engineering manager. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But, but HP was on it. A rapid growth so by the end of the 70s um, they wanted me to build an entirely new factory for printed circuits and um, and so you know in the end of the 70s I started working on the Sunnyvale facility which was enormously more automated and advanced than um, than the one in Palo Alto kind of thing mm -hmm. um, and that led me then to being invited to Moscow and the US trade mission for automation and led me to Taiwan because the Taiwan government wanted multi-layers and ICs um, and eventually to move into Taiwan to manage the development of the Nanya Plastic PCB multi-layer factory um, which made boards in for HP and then to Hong Kong where I uh, was in market development for Asia Pacific in automation and electronics kind of thing and then back to being an R&D manager of packaging and um, um, uh, and other growth. Uh, eventually, until HP closed down all of its print circuit facilities and all of its assembly facilities, um, it was all outsourced. And it was outsourced because the guys in Taiwan were making multilayers for us at a, a, a third the price that we were making for internally. And since they were all, all the engineers at, in Taiwan were trained at the Hewlett Packard facility in Palo Alto mm. and Sunnyvale. Um, and so they knew how to make boards for us. In fact, we had to do special training to teach them how to make tin lead boards because they were used to making our copper nickel gold and copper nickel tin boards. Um, but we had specifically had to you know, teach them how to do tin lead reflow boards because the rest of the world was going to order tin lead, not the HP process. Yeah. You told me a funny story once, Happy, about <clears throat> how when you kind of migrated over to Asia that, I, I don't know, I think I was saying something about, you know, before China overtook the electronics industry or whatever, and you kind of winced and you go, yeah, I thought, I think that's my fault. I was like, no, one person isn't responsible, but then Please share the story you shared with me. So well, um, yeah. So the the Nanya plant went online in 1985. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I got some interesting pictures of 
of the president of Hewlett Packard, John Young, myself, and the president of Formosa Plastics walking down the printer circuit shop where the HP president asks me all these questions. Um, the interesting thing about the president of Nanya Plastics was he's a chemical engineer educated in Texas. Um, and he, he's a real crazy man, but innovated enough that Formosa was the world's biggest plastics company. And the government wanted them involved in electronics because they had all the money and they were some of the biggest corporations. And getting into printed circuits had this enormous government blessing for Nanya to do that. But Nanya doesn't do things in a little way. They they built a factory five times larger than anything we had in HP, which was wisdom on their part. And one of the things that HP found is, well, look, we, we can buy just as good a quality from them because they're trained by HP and HP engineers set up and ran it. Why do we need to have our own PC shops? Um, and so we started buying more and more outsource. Well, that affected assembly as well. And then sooner or later, we were outsourcing everything in the early 2000s like everybody else. And, um, you know, and one of the reasons why they were so active is what we didn't know was um, after 1985, um, each year the press in Taiwan would kind of do a competition. What was the most profitable businesses in Taiwan? And it used to be um, pineapple, sugar, and textiles, shoes, Nike shoes. After Nanya got started, starting in 85, the most profitable corporation in Taiwan was making circuit board, was Nanya. And for 15 solid years, they were the most profitable company in Taiwan making Re circuit boards. Really trained by HP. Right. But that wasn't part of the article. They were just a Taiwan company. Yeah, yeah, of course. And people told me later that everybody got an idea the way to print money was to make circuit boards. And so everybody and his brother jumped into making circuit boards and the prices crashed, yeah. you know. And when they crashed, they they took a majority of the American circuit board people with them because they couldn't compete price-wise. Right. I, you know, so I I don't know if I had – my defense is that I was ordered to do it. <laughs> I, I was only following orders. So. <laughs> I can't predict the future. Huh? So funny. I was talking to, I think it was Todd at Calumet when I went up oh. to visit MTU, and then I went over and saw Calumet, and you had shared the story about, you know, the Taiwanese government wanted HP to teach them a trade, and so, yeah. you know, you did what you were told and whatever, and and Todd said to me, do you know whose fault it is for <laughs> For an offshore movement, I said, "Yeah, happy holding." And he goes, "Exactly." <laughs> so we had a good laugh over that one. I go, "It is personally his fault." No, not exactly, but it was an interesting story, anyways. Um, well, let me get into the keynote. Is what we're supposed to. Okay, let's hear about it. So, um, for our listeners, Happy will be a keynote speaker at Altium Live in Frankfurt. He will also be offering a full day class on uh what's the title of your full day class do you remember oh. i know it's, it's about hdi but i don't remember the title anyways he's oh, well, i think product realization using hdi technology or something there it, you it's go it's not a course it's not a course on how to make print circuit boards it's a course on uh the electrical performance and the advantages and drivers of using high density interconnect right uh, uh, and, and and to blow up the myth that, well, you have to use HDI because of fine pitch, but you're gonna pay more for it. And so part of the thing is, well, yes, you can pay more, but if you take a class like this, and I'll show you some of the insights, because we started doing HDI, Lazy Drill Vias in 1982, you know, not 2002, but 82. Um, for our first 15 years, we treated laser drill blind vias as small through holes. And mm. that's not the way to think about it. And so part of the class is un unlearning a lot of things about multilayers, because if you're gonna use HDI, you, the miniaturization can allow you to use fewer layers and a smaller board, which HDI should save you money. And so one of the um, sections of the full day class 
is case studies, four different things in which we take complex 18 or 24 layer through hole multi-layer and we make it into an eight layer or 10 layer HDI board with higher performance and half the price or a third the price. But um, anybody else, would it would be more expensive than the through hole board because they would keep the through hole and just add HDI layers to it to make it more expensive. They would take advantage of, of how to design it so that I, I need only half as many signal layers and things like that. So the, the full day course is about the trends, the drivers, oh, uh, about the quality and reliability mm -hmm. and how you qualify a, a vendor um, because you, you don't just micro section micro vias to figure out can a person make a good HDI board. The case study, uh, next generation, we're already in second and third generation HDI, what is that? And then where is this all going? What's the, the next step after HDI? So that's the, the full day class. So um, for for listeners that may not be acquainted with Happy's work, he's often been um, coined as the father of HDI. He's written an enormous tome, um, the HDI Handbook. And he's also written some things um, for us here at Altium. And I'll make sure and share those things in the show note. There's a, you know, updated HDI guidebook. <laughs> Um, and so lots of good materials and again you get to learn from the master because again happy what's really I've learned from happy is that so many of these things were being done years and years and years sometimes 20 years before it was adopted by the mainstream industry and HP kept that that IP close at hand and it's part of their success and so he has lots of really really compelling interesting things to share so um, then now, now the keynote yes the keynote won't be about HDI although that's a favorite topic um, but it will be you know choices I made a third of it is on the uh, the smart factory and how um, the smart factory is here and operating today um, but but it'll kind of blow you away that you know print circuits um, sophisticated 36 layer boards can be built in two days and things like that but I'll show you the, the pictures and give you a video the, the second part is the smart factory only works because we digitized the entire PC board as a product and so um, the issues in uh, developing the new um, IPC design standards and things like that that, that Altium supports um, that provides the digital recipes you need to run one of these smart factories including the assembly. And then the last part is the fun thing is in terms of a, a few slides about what some older uh, PC board CAD tools had in terms of continuous performance feedback as you design and lay out the board and about the artificial intelligence AI system that HP Labs worked on for us that would automatically design printed circuit boards and what we learned from artificial intelligence um, 25 years ago um, in terms of how artificial intelligence can significantly improve speed and performance of designing printed circuit boards. And of course this audience now shakes in terror at you talking about that because they're afraid they're all going to be out of a job. Oh, no, just the opposite. It, it means that their productivity will go up and their quality will go up so much that now they can, now they, they won't always be the, um, the, the constraint on the, the cycle time. Um, it'll be the other parts of the electronic chain and, and not the PC. Because although you have, have the artificial intelligence, I'll show you the slides, it still needed an experienced printed circuit designer to, uh, to feed the artificial intelligence and then to make the final decision. So it's it's really a quality productivity enhancement tool and allow you to keep up, keep you all the balls in the air because more and more it's tougher to keep all those balls in the air for, for environment, for signal integrity, for density, for cost, for reliability, you know, you know, how are you gonna do that? Well, artificial intelligence will be the your helper to, to keep all the balls in the air. Yeah. Well, um, for our audience, beyond all this amazing, these talks Happy's gonna give and his experience that 
uh, was so enriching at HP. He's also worked for Gentex, which I think he'll uh, mention in his talks. He was also a CTO at Foxconn. So he has so much wisdom to share, and we are so excited to have him and, and share him with you at Altium Live. Um, now for a couple fun points, Happy, because I think you're so fun and interesting. Um, what are a couple of the indicators that you saw at, when you were a young boy that might have, looking back, now you realize, oh, I, yep, I, I, I was on an engineering path at a young age. Um, yeah, that was something you mentioned, and that takes a, a bit of a reflection. I, the, the earliest thing I think I remember is reading the classic of uh, science fiction, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells. Um, Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote about uh, uh, the warriors on Mars, interesting enough, from not just the Sherlock Holmes stuff. Um, and from that, that lit me into the modern American classics, which was Asimov and Heinlein and Ray Bradbury, Arthur Clarke, things like that. Um, all through grade school, uh, we didn't have television. So in grade school, you know, I spent time either reading or um, or building my own toys and um, inventions. You know, making my own crystal radio set and running the antenna kind of thing was, was fun. If, if any of you have ever seen a, a germanium crystal um, radio set. But, um, um, yeah, I once, because I was a Boy Scout, in Boy's Life, the back of it was a thing of, from OK Cub about, um, about buying, a, building a, a radio controlled airplane. I was only 10 years old and got one of these things. Never got it to work because nobody around could help me with the electronic, the one tube transmitter, one tube receiver, and everything. Uh, now, you know, we, we moved after, soon after that to San Diego. And I went into a school system in San Diego, um, heavily powered by the Navy. Mm -hmm. And in the seventh grade, I ended up. Everybody, I had to take a wood shop with power tools and things like that in the seventh grade and graphic arts, which was drafting, blueprinting, um, and things like that. In the eighth grade, I had metal shop, welding, metal, and um, electrical shop, but I took the option on electronics. So in the eighth grade, they were teaching me electronics, um, uh, mostly tubes, but some transistor theory and everything. Um, not in college, I wasn't even in high school, I was in the eighth grade. Well, Amazing. That really, yeah. one of the things I did was get the, the one tube RC airplane to work once after that eighth grade kind of thing. But um, that that really helped set it off is that, um, you know, having that kind of education in school. Uh, also, you know, I, I learned about the slide rule and logarithms, which they don't teach anymore. but. You know, I know how to use a slide rule. <laughs> no batteries required. Yeah. The HP calculator killed the slide rule, I think. So, yeah. Within, within <laughs> two or three years, it wasn't slide rules anyway, because why? You could do it so much faster with the HP calculator. Exactly. So funny. In but fact, you... I, I, I worked for nearly 10 years on all those calculators. So I have a box here of 30 or 40 different calculators. Oh my gosh, you need to bring some of those to all team live or send them to me and I'll carry them over just to show off. People would probably get a kick out of that. I, I took them up to the course at uh, Michigan Tech and the students had never seen them before. I mean, you'd have to go to the museum to see yeah, these things. Yeah, seriously. Um, and half of them have um, I.O. ports. You know, they go onto networks and things like that. that uh, Crazy. they have never seen before. So That's yeah. fun, yeah. You should bring those happy or send I'm, them to me and I'm, I'll bring them with. Uh, but calculators were a fun because Motorola came to us with help in 90, 1994 and how to miniaturize their mobile phone from this big block into something the size of a calculator. And HP, we redesigned it, introduced them to blind vias and everything. And, uh, and the Microtech mo modern mobile phone was born to, to Motorola. We even made one out of polyamide, rigid flex polyamide. You could fold up the size of a watch. Wow, uh, that's crazy. And it was their phone. We just took the chips out of the um, lead frame, 
um, for the through hole parts. And we uh, uh, we bumped them and flipped them over, you know, so we made them a phone the quarter the size of what they had designed that could be folded up the size of a of a watch. They were flabbergasted because they were told by Motorola R and D that that's impossible. It's impossible. Yeah. How many times have we broken things that people have told us it's impossible in this industry? Well, um, last fun question because I I think it's interesting. How did you get the name Happy? Is that your real name? Yes. It, it, How did else, you get that name Happy? That's not a nickname. That's my real name. And it came because my father had a family friend, Albert Chandler. And um, before I was born, Albert Chandler was the commissioner of baseball. And um, um, But his nickname was Happy. And so you, if you look him up, you look him up as Happy Chandler. Um, after Commissioner of Baseball became the governor of Arkansas or someplace. But anyway, um, my older sister was named Melody. And so because of the family plan Happy Chandler, they thought Happy would be uh, useful. I mean, I, I'm not sure Fun. why. That's, but what you know, are your siblings' names? Well, then it was downhill from there. Because then my <laughs> brother, they named him Jolly. And my sister, they named Gay. And my other sister, they named Honey. So <laughs> Melody wasn't quite so bad. Happy. And then Happy was just downhill. In the, so uh, Melody got away and skated. And then everybody got the Happy Jolly names. But we're all overachievers. You know, my older sister, assistant district attorney, my brother, two-star general in the Air Force. Nobody, nobody in the Air Force, except if you know what J. Taylor Holden is, what J stands for. They think John or something like that. Mm -hmm. No, jolly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, nobody knows that. Oh, I bet I, he dare not. Says J. Taylor Holden. Yeah. He's retired now, but. I bet but, you he didn't dare say that to his, his comrades. <laughs> like they would have chewed him up if he wasn't JT. That's he, he funny. Was he got he got chosen to bring the uh, prisons of war back from Vietnam. Oh, you know, kind of thing. Uh, he was on the, those flights that that um, brought um, <sighs> the POWs back. From yeah, Vietnam, that's kind of thing. that's good work. Well, well, happy. Thanks so much for joining us today. We can't wait to to be with you in Frankfurt. Thank you for agreeing to do the full day class and the keynote. And I'm sure everybody that attends will. Um, well, enjoy those hopefully talks. if you're going to Frankfurt, um, um, you'll see this so that when we're having the cocktail time and things like that, you can seek me out. You know what I look like now. And, um, <laughs> you know, and if, you know, and we can go over some of the stories that we, Judy and I didn't talk to you about. But the problem was there's too many here for the time we've got. No. So here's one thing for our listeners. If you want to hear more of happy stories, then comment down below here. And if you want to tell more, maybe I can talk happy into some more. The other thing I wanted to do is to... Um, I want to give away a couple of tickets to Altium Live. So I have two day summits. It's three days in total with university days, but I can give away um, a two day summit ticket, which is a 600 US dollar value. I'd like to give away one for Frankfurt where Happy will be teaching and also one for San Diego. So what I'd like you to do is go to um, email uh, me at ontrack at altium.com send me some screenshots or just write me some text about something cool you've designed with all team designer and we'll have ben jordan and dave haboud and some of our guys inside take a look at them and um whoever has the most interesting design i'll send you a free ticket to come see happy or come to san diego where you'll see eric bogton rick hartley and others so thanks so much for joining us today i know you've enjoyed happy holden we look forward to being with you next time make sure to like subscribe and always tell us what you'd like to hear about next we'll see you next time until then remember to always stay on track